Hi again, folks. Just a quick reminder that this is the second of three videos for tutorial two, and we're working with the same data as the previous tutorial, which you can also find in the file data underscore three underscore one dot sav. All right, I told you I tend to go back to my data file rather than uh, do the analyses straight from the output file. There's absolutely no reason to do that. That's a little bit of superstition on my part, so I'm going to try not to. So here I am in my output file, not going back to my, my uh, data file, and I'm going to look at descriptive. So descriptive, the descriptive function can be used to compute summary statistics uh, for interval and ratio variables. It can be used to calculate z-scores or z-scores for each raw score and to look at some graphs. So the way to do that is analyze. You can do this from your data file or your output file. Again, descriptive statistics, descriptives. All right, now in the descriptives dialog, we're gonna use the arrow button to move our two Likert scale items, our two original Likert scale items over to variables. And we could have, we could look at age, we could look at course satisfaction, but just for the sake of having two variables, you can look at more if you really want. Right? And just like before, we are going to select some options. This was called statistics in frequencies, but it's called options here. Again, I'm interested in the mean, some measures of dispersion. You can look at kurtosis and skewness if you're really interested in them. Oh, I guess we are gonna report them. And again, we can specify the display order. So variable list is your specified order. So however um, you organized your data, alphabetic by alphabetical, and then ascending means and descending means. So this is what order are the uh, variables that you selected going to appear. All right now I'm going to click continue. We're not at this point going to worry about style or bootstrap. So the only other thing I'm going to point out is in descriptives you can save standardized values as variables. So this means uh, like computing the Z scores from the raw scores. Um, so let's select that and click OK. And now our output table of contents has gotten a little bit longer. Just a little bit though. We've got our descriptives way at the bottom. Uh, we've got the sample size under N, minimum, maximum, the arithmetic mean, the standard deviation. We've got information about skewness and kurtosis. And there's a nice little screen grab of variables with pretty extreme positive skew and negative skew on page 25 of the pink book, if you're interested. By the time you're watching this, I'm guessing we've already talked a fair bit about these descriptive statistics. All right now, we want to go back to our data file. And you'll notice because we checked that save standardized var values as variables option, we've now got Z and Joy, which is the standardized score for the Enjoy scores, and Z easy. I'm sorry, Z, I'm still getting used to that. Um, I, and again, on page 25 of the pink book, there is that little formula for Z scores where Z is the observation value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. All right, what I want you to do on your own is describe the Q5 sample the way you would in APA style. So as you're doing this in APA style, or don't, don't worry about it if you don't want, uh, see what you can say 
about the central tendency dispersion and shape. That is, is it skewed? Uh, is there acute kurtosis um, of variable Q5? It is easy to get good grades in my course. And just to give you an example, I'm going to describe the variable Q4. I'm enjoying my course. So here's my description. 15 students. There should be an apostrophe there. 15 students. Mean course enjoyment rating was 3.67 with a standard deviation of 1.18. And notice that SD is in italics. And I've said more students rated their course highly, which is uh, which means that there's a negative tail, so the sample was negatively skewed. So that's what I'm, I mean about talk about shape. So at this point, I don't want to see numbers, stats, relating to skewness or kurtosis. Now, in your reading, if you're reading journal articles, you'll probably only see skewness and kurtosis measured when the author does something about them. So, for example, we might say something like, because course enjoyment ratings were negatively skewed, we log transformed scores before conducting inferential statistical tests. All right. Now what I'd like you to do on your own is write a description of Q5. And now we're ready to move on to the explore function. Explore is a handy way to check assumptions before you compute inferential statistics, generate descriptive statistics, which anytime you report uh, inferential statistics, you want to include the associated descriptive statistics, and to cast an eye over your samples. Right? Um, I hope by now in the lectures we've talked about the intraocular trauma test, that is, does the assumptions, violation, or lack thereof, hit you between the eyes. Okay. And so that's a little bit of that using your common sense to make determinations about do I want to transform my data before I conduct my inferential statistics. All right. So I'm back in my data file. Now suppose we wanted to ask the question, is course satisfaction different for males versus females? What I'm going to do is go to Analyze, and again, Descriptive Statistics, and Explore. I love it. It's got a normal distribution, which is hopefully how, potentially, hopefully how your data are distributed, and then a magnifying glass because you are going to scrutinize that data. All right. So we've got the Explore dialog. So we want to move the variable or variables that we want to explore into the dependent variable list. So the variables we are, we're only going to explore one variable, and that's course satisfaction. Just to keep things simple, you see what it looks like when we have multiple variables. Now this time, if we're going to ask, is course satisfaction different for males versus females, gender is our factor. So we select gender, put it in the factor list, and we don't want to label cases any differently at this point. And we can use the explore function to produce descriptive statistics, to generate plots, or to do both. And we're going to do both. Um, real estate on the screen is not precious, uh, so we might as well just generate a whole bunch of stuff. The next thing we're going to do is click on the statistics button. We want descriptives. Let's look at confidence intervals around the mean of 95%, the sort of traditional 95% confidence intervals. You might also be interested in outliers if you're concerned that your data include extreme values that are not representative of the underlying distribution. I'm also going to look at percentiles just because I'm in the habit of doing that and I like percentiles. So I'm going to click continue. And the next thing we're going to look at is plots. The 
So we have the option of looking at just stem and leaf plots or just histograms or both. I'm going to check both of them. We are generally going to want to look at factor levels together. We can include tests for normality. And we will leave out the leaving tests for the time being. So click continue. All right, now we're going to click OK to conduct the analyses. And our output list just got way longer. All right, now where is it? So under explore, the cases, the first thing is the case processing summary, which shows how many cases were analyzed and whether any were excluded, which there weren't. It's a good reminder, we have six males and nine females. They all reported some degree of course satisfaction. So they all reported some degree of course satisfaction. So we have data for everything. Now we've got separate descriptive statistics for males and females. The one that I want to call your attention to is that 95% confidence interval for the mean. We have a lower bound and an upper bound for males and a lower bound and an upper bound for females. Depending on how you coded males and females, you might have females listed first. Um, the numbers should be the same though. Now, if your estimating population parameters based on sample data, we can be 95% confident, and I hope we talked in lecture about what that means. Uh, that the interval between the lower bound and the upper, upper bound includes the true population mean. Um, now what's really interesting about this is if we want to ask the question, uh, do scores for males and females differ? One way of making that comparison is to examine the 95% confidence intervals around the mean. And if the 95% confidence intervals don't overlap, that's equivalent to getting a statistical, statistically significant result, okay? then we can say that um, male scores and female scores were significantly different. But you notice that the lower males, the male confidence interval is 2.28 to 4.89, whereas the female confidence interval is 2.49 to 4.29. So not identical, but a fair degree of overlap. I've also got percentiles, just because I'm interested in them. So um, we could look at Tukey's hinges or the interquartile ranges or what have you. Um, I like to have those. It makes me feel, um, feel like no matter how my data turn out, I have something that I can report. Now that so I want to warn you to, to interpret statistical tests of normality with caution. Right? Use your common sense first. The problem with both the Kolmogorov, Smirnov, and the Shapiro-Wilkes test is that with large samples, they can be hypersensitive to small deviations from normality. Right? So you get a very small deviation and it happens to be statistically significant. You might not care about those small deviations. And then at the other end, with small samples, a normal distribution might not produce a normally distributed sample if your sample size is very small. So it's difficult to infer from a small sample that is not normally distributed that the underlying distribution is not normally distributed. Okay, so what do you do? What I recommend is that you look at the QQ plots. Now just look at this slide and tell me what you, or think about what you see in the QQ plots of course satisfaction for males. So the graph on the left shows the expected normal score as a function 
of the observed value. So expected normal on the y-axis and observed value on the x-axis. And this line is what we would see if the sample were perfectly normally distributed. Then SPSS also shows us uh, the same data another way. So it's just like you take this line and you flip it and you make that zero. So this is a question of how, how far from normal is each observed value. Uh, and what it looks like to me is that most scores are a little higher than they would be if they were sampled from a distribution with a mean of 3.58, which is the mean for males, and a standard deviation of 1.24. Then we've got one score that is much lower. So what do we do with this non-normal sample? Well, one of your options is that you trim the outlier, get rid of that outlier score, get, maybe get rid of the highest and lowest scores, and then you, you don't have that one value, but you also don't have the highest score, right? Um, that lowers your statistical power. We could conclude that these data are not normally distributed, so rather than do a standard parametric test, we do a non-parametric test. That also produces lower statistical power. The third option that we have is that we can acknowledge this deviation from normality in the in the results that we report, but then say uh, we determined that this was not a severe enough violation to uh, warrant further action. We did a parametric test anyway. Um, with these data, with this small sample size, if you went with any three of those options, that would be fine with me as far as a unit coordinator marking your practical report.